So do you guys want to say hi to the American Fork campus? Can you guys say it louder? They're going nuts right now, what I understand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we're going through a series now called uh, Genesis to Jesus, Discovering Jesus in the, in the Old Testament. We're already on part two of Genesis chapter three, so we're just Moving right along through the Word of God. Today I'm going to just give a little bit of a background. Um, I know I say this every week, but I love this message. I just love the things that I discovered. I love studying the Bible because it is so vast. And um, so in light of that, it's a, it's a little intimidating for me because I want to make sure that I, that I bring whatever the word of the Lord is for you today specifically. So would you join me? Would you pray with me and for me? Uh, Lord, I, I just thank you so much for your word. God, your, your word is eternal. Lord, your word uh, never fails. Lord, your word has given us everything we need for life and godliness, and we just thank you so much. And Lord, in in teaching it this morning, I do ask that you would go before me, Lord, that you would open up the hearts and the minds of the listeners, Lord, and that they would just grow in the knowledge and the grace of you, Jesus. Just pray that you would pour out your spirit in this place. Bring understanding, Lord. Bring knowledge in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I started reading this, I thought, wow, this would be such a cool movie. So I kind of tailored the message a little bit to make it a little bit like a movie. And so we started with part one last week, and uh, not that this is a sequel, and I don't in any way want to imply that when you read about something in the Word of God, it's not allegorical um, or uh, symbolic, but there really was a guy named Adam, Adam, and there was a woman named Eve. These were historical characters. They were the first people who were ever created. And when it talks about a tree, that's, it's, that's a literal tree. I mean, some, some things are, of course, allegorical and some are symbolic, but these stories are literal and they are historically accurate. And um, starting out with the tree, it says in uh, Genesis chapter 2, Verse 9, it says, The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. And in the middle of the garden, he placed what? Number one, the tree of life. And number two, so he put these two trees in the middle of the garden. And in verse 15, it says, And the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. So now enter the protagonists of the story, the humans in the story. Actually, God's the ultimate protagonist, but Adam and Eve are the good guys in the story, kind of. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And then the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. We talked extensively last week about the fact that that word helper is kind of a terrible translation because it's so much more all-encompassing. You know, the, the Hebrew language is so rich. And this particular word misses a lot because this is actually talking about the same help as God is our help and our strength, and it's talking about the mighty men of valor, and it's that same word. It's talking about power, and it's talking about someone who comes alongside. It's talking about someone who, who partners with someone else. That's really a better translation for this. So it says in verse 19, The Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. 
He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from that rib, and he brought her to the man. Last week, someone shared with me, did you know that the rib is a bone that can replenish itself? It can grow back? If you remove a rib, another one will grow in its place. Did you know that? Isn't that profound? God's economy. God didn't waste anything. He took the rib out and created the woman from that. And Adam was pretty excited, and he said, At last, this one is bone of my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. So this explains why a, father, uh, why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. You know, the scripture that says a man will leave his father and mother and join, be joined to his wife, and the two are united into one flesh, this is, again, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says this is a profound mystery but it's talking about Christ in the church. And it says in the Proverbs, whoever finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. And so the thing is, Adam was kind of lonely. He was all by himself. And then God in his goodness brought him the perfect companion for him. And I I wanted to show you, I kind of wanted to spice up the message a little and have some visual things and show you a picture. But a lot of the pictures that I looked at online are kind of weird, as you can imagine. (laughs) Some of them are kind of not appropriate for church. (laughs) But I did find one that I thought, this this kind of encapsulates it. Could you put that picture? (laughs) I think this might be actual footage. I'm not sure. But so there we have Adam and Eve. They're naked. See? They're naked. You can tell your friends you saw Naked picture of Adam and Eve in church today, because none of your friends will be able to say that. So there they are in the garden. Isn't that wonderful? This is before the fall, because they're not covered up. So that's how you can tell. So enter the serpent. The serpent. You know, every movie you go to, they always have to have the, yeah, boom, boom, boom. You know, like they have to have the drama. Otherwise, a movie would be pretty boring. So they have to enter the conflict. Well, here, the conflict comes in the form of a serpent, the antagonist. This serpent is also called Lucifer. Now, Lucifer was thrown out of heaven. He was the the worship leader in heaven. He was like really, really special, and he was very beautiful. As it says in Isaiah 14, How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. And Ezekiel 28 says, and this is talking about, uh, well, he's called Lucifer before he's thrown out, and then after that he's called Satan or Beelzebub or whatever. But here it says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until what? Till what happened? Evil was found in him. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty and your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. And I I think you can make a case that you can pretty much trace all sin back to pride. See, that was the thing. It said his heart was filled with pride. And really what pride does is pride says, God, you don't quite know as much as I do, so I'm going to take care of this on my own, or I'm going to provide for myself, or, you know, I'm going to do this on my own without you. And that's ultimately what pride does, is it prevents you from really 
understanding God's love for us and understanding the provision that he wants for us. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, this is where the serpent enters. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Now, think about Satan. It says that everything he says is a lie. He's the father of all lies. They say, how can you tell when Satan's lying? When you can see his lips move. But anyway, um, it says, did he really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Is that really what God said? See, he distorted it. God said, you can eat the fruit of any of the trees except this one. This is the only one that God said, please don't eat that one. Because when you do, your eyes will be opened. Adam and Eve didn't understand evil. They had no concept of evil. They didn't have that knowledge. And what God's intention was, was that they would continue to walk in fellowship with with him and that they would only know life and light and goodness, that they would never have to know evil and death. It says, um, Eve replies and she says, of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Well, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. Do you think she really, if she would look back, would really have wanted the wisdom that gave her? Because what was the wisdom? The wisdom was of evil or the knowledge of evil. She, be, she understood death, sin and death at that point. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it and she gave some to her husband who was with her. He was standing right there and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were opened and suddenly... They felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. See, up until this point, they had no idea that they should feel any shame in their nakedness. So what they did was they sewed the fig leaves together and covered themselves. And as we talked about last week, usually anything having to do with uh, plants or growth or whatever is symbolic of works, of the works of our hands. And so here they are covering themselves up with the fig leaves that they had sewn together. God bless you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Genesis 3.10, he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. See, it was God's fault, right? It wasn't his fault because he was standing there. And then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied, and that's why I ate. How sad, huh? This is a sad story. But we like to think that if we would have been there, we wouldn't have eaten it, right? Don't you like to think that about yourself? Like, if I would have been there, no way. But each and every one of us, I think if we're really honest with ourselves, we can say, yeah, I probably would have eaten it. I probably would have been curious. I probably would have wanted I probably would have wanted the knowledge, even though looking back, we probably wouldn't. I found another picture. This is Adam and Eve after the fall. Get it? Fall? Never mind. You guys don't get it. (laughs) So actually, here's the meat of the lesson here. We're going to talk about the curses today. That was all just kind of a review. We're going to talk about the curses. The first one, the serpent. Up until this point... I don't think that the serpent was actually a snake. I don't think that he slithered around because, as you'll see, that's part of his curse. 
there are many people that claim that Satan or the serpent um, stood on hind legs or walked on all fours. Or could you show that picture? Or that he had like little feet up until this point. It says in verse 14, it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, because he tempted Eve, deceived her. It says, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Some translations say that you will eat dirt. Because imagine if you're slithering on the ground, everything you eat would have dirt on it, right? But up until this point, he wasn't slithering on the ground. Did you know that human beings are the only creatures that stand upright? Think about it. The closest thing, the next closest thing is like gorillas, but they kind of stoop over and they kind of use their knuckles. Human beings are the only ones who stand upright. So that's why when the Bible talks about walking uprightly before the Lord, it's in communion with God. It's having fellowship with God, walking with him. Um, Matthew Henry says, there is a continual conflict between grace and corruption in the hearts of God's people. Satan, by their corruptions, assaults them, buffets them, sifts them, and seeks to devour them. They, the humans, by their exercise of their graces, resist him, wrestling with him, quench his fiery darts, force him to flee from them. Heaven and hell can never be reconciled, nor can light and darkness. No more can Satan and a sanctified soul, for these are contrary to one another." It says in Genesis uh, 3.15, it says, I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. So now think about this for a minute. When you go back to your your, uh, biology class in high school, think about this. It says, I will cause, cause hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and Her seed. What's wrong with this picture? In biology, who has the seed? The male. The female in the human species does not have the seed. So what is this referencing? This is talking about the virgin birth. This is talking about the seed that was to over, when the Holy Spirit came and overshadowed Mary, this is the seed that has never been in a male. It is a seed coming from the Holy Spirit that impregnated Mary. So that is what this is a reference to. And it says, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is the first reference that it's talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus because You know, when Jesus went to the cross to pay the price for our sins, the enemy thought he had won. That's, he struck his heel. He thought it was over. But because of the power of the resurrection, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he overcame sin and death and the curse. So all of this stuff seems like really bad news, except when you read it in the light of the fact that this was the original curse, but Jesus came to do what? Came to break the curse. So when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he stomped on the head of Satan. He overcame all of the plans of the evil one, and it says we are not ignorant of his schemes. He still continues today to try to lie to us. He tries to distort the word of God. He tries to change what God said to us, to twist it. He tries to create confusion between relationships. He tries to stir up division. He tries to stir up problems in marriages. Anybody anybody married ever felt like sometimes you're contending against something that maybe is beyond just human? Ever? Ever? To the woman, verse 16, he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. You see, up until this time, there were no babies born, right? There were only two human beings, and they'd never had a child. It says, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. This isn't the greatest translation here, because 
that word desire, there are three explanations for what this means. Some people claim that this means it's a, it's a physical desire, a sexual desire that, sh- that women will have for their husbands. But I contend that because I, I... How many of you have ever heard the saying, not tonight, I have a headache? I mean, anybody? That's a reality, okay? Also, there are only three references to this word in the Old Testament, that, that word desire. One of the references is here where it's saying you will, your desire will be for your husband. But it also comes in the form of sin has come, is crouching at your door when it's talking about Cain killing his brother Abel in the next chapter. It says that that's that same desire is to control, to snuff out, to dominate. And if we're honest, ladies, I'm going to be nice to you this week, nicer than I was last week. <laughs> kind of beat you up a little bit last week. How many of you can admit, husbands, keep your elbows to yourselves, please. How many women can admit you kind of want to control? Yeah? We want to control, don't we? When we're walking in the flesh, when we're not walking in the spirit, we want to be in charge. Right? Uh, No? So quiet. Wow. This is talking about, there's a third explanation for this word, and it's, it's talking about how women will have that longing and that yearning and that desire. But it's not only to control, but it's also to derive something from our husbands that only God can provide for us. That yearning, even single women, you know, longing, thinking that, oh, if only I had a husband, then I would have no problems. Because that's true, right? All you married people, you're, you're like, yeah, no, once I got married, I didn't have any problems after that, right? <laughs> this is talking about this word. And like I said, there, there are the three explanations, but I think it might be a kind of a combination of all of them. But this is what's under the curse. And in the Amplified Bible, it says, um, it's talking to... The serpent, it says, I will put enmity or open hostility between the serpent and the woman, between your seed or your offspring and her seed. He shall fatally bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. But to the woman, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth and in pain you will give birth to children. Yet your desire, your longing, and your yearning will be for your husband. But he will rule over you. And he will be responsible for you. This is talking about the curse. This is talking about when we are not walking in the spirit, we're going we're gonna to desire to control and snuff out, right? And yearn for these things. It says in John 16, 21, it says, this will be like a woman suffering in the pains of labor, When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. See, Jesus came to break the curse. He came to overcome the law of sin and death. And here, I've had four babies, and I don't remember the pain at all. I mean, I guess I I, I had pain because Eric told me I did. But it says that because of the joy of holding that child or because of the joy of having that life, that we forget the anguish. See, it, husbands don't get to forget it. That's kind of the problem. <laughs> they remember it. Otherwise, n- no woman would ever have more than one baby, I guarantee. If we remembered our pain, I don't think women would have more than one child. So the next character we have here is the man. Genesis three seventeen. To the man, he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. And in the Amplified Bible, it says, Then to Adam, the Lord God says, Because you have listened attentively to the voice of your wife, you've eaten the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. The ground is now under a curse because of you. 
In sorrow and toil you shall eat the fruit of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, until you return to the ground, for from it, from the ground, you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Verse 18 says, It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat, until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. This is the first reference to death. Because that wasn't in the original plan. That, Like in God's perfect world, if they would have just eaten from the tree of life, there wouldn't have been death. But here there's death. And, it, and one of the things when it comes to the curse, so many men, I think, I've never been a man, so I can't verify this, but it seems that there's really this struggle for men with work, concerning work. And yet it says in Ecclesiastes, there is nothing better than for a man to enjoy his work. And it says, whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly unto the Lord as though you were serving God, not men, not human beings. And I think that is where that curse can be broken as we surrender. Men, as you surrender your job to the Lord, as you surrender your whatever you happen to be doing, the, the toil and the trials, surrendering it to the Lord and doing it as unto the Lord, not doing it as unto your boss or doing, you know, unto the, the man, but just doing it unto the Lord. The sacrifice, Genesis 3.20 says, The man, Adam, named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. Remember, she hasn't had any children yet. It's just the two of them. It says, The Lord God made clothing from the animal skins for Adam and his wife. Check that out. Remember, they made skins to cover themselves. They sewed them together. They did it themselves. This represents works. This represents the work of their own hands. But it says here, the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. This is the first what in the Bible? Sacrifice. This is the first sacrifice. Because an animal had to give its life for them to be covered up. And throughout the Bible, remember before Jesus went to the cross, remember they had to, they had to bring animals in, sacrifices in, to pay the price for their sin. Because it said in Leviticus, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So here, God provided. God provided an animal as a covering to cover their nakedness. Isn't that awesome? That's the first reference to that. After they sinned, they covered themselves with leaves, representing works, but God covered them with animal skins, indicating that first sacrifice, the first shedding of blood. Verse 22 says, Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. Isn't this awesome news? They blew it. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but God also provided the tree of life and said that if they reach out and eat of its fruit, they can live forever. This is talking about eternal life, and it comes from the tree of life. And in Proverbs 3.18, it says, She, talking about wisdom, is a tree of life to those who grasp her. Whoever holds on to her is happy. Proverbs 9, 9, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. It says in Proverbs 14, 1, it says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Foolishness and wisdom are opposites. And the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But here it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And that tree of life that they could reach out and grasp is symbolic of the cross. 
Remember, the cross is referred to as a tree. Cursed is the one who died on the tree. That's talking about the cross, talking about Jesus. But the cross, which was intended to be a tree of death, ultimately became a tree of life because Jesus went to the cross as a perfect sacrifice and provided a way for us to be able to live forever and to be forgiven. Isn't that awesome? Verse 23 says, So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. He sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. And then it says that they put that there was an angel there with a sword and that they had to leave the Garden of Eden, and for the rest of their lives, they had to contend against this curse, even though Jesus came to set us free. He came to set us free from the law of sin and death, from the curse. Jesus came to bless, and that's still his desire today. But we so often fall into that tendency to walk as though we were under a curse, don't we? We don't walk as though we were really free. We don't walk as though we really believed that the Lord is with us. It says that, that he, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth, seeking those whose hearts are completely his. That is his desire. But so much of the time, we walk around as though God wasn't paying any attention to us. And his desire is that we would reach out from that tree of life and eat of its fruit and that we would be fulfilled and that we would be able to be set free and delivered from the curse, from that law that, w that wants to choke life out of us. And isn't that what our hearts long for, to be free? Could you stand with me this morning? Let's just surrender this over to the Lord. Well, Lord, we, we thank you so much, Lord, that you provided that sacrifice. Lord, that you provided the animal skins. Lord, that that, that blood that was shed, symbolizing the sacrifice that you made for us when you went to the cross for our sins. Lord, and we thank you that you cover us. Lord, that the sacrifice that you provide covers us so that we no longer have to walk about in shame. Lord, we bless you and we thank you, Lord, that you provided that tree of life. Lord, and if we reach out and eat from its fruit, God, we can live forever and not just have eternal life, but we can also walk free. And Lord, that's our desire. We long to walk free. We long to receive the forgiveness and the sacrifice that you offered. Lord, we lift up that wonderful name of Jesus, and we thank you, and we bless you. We bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Next week, we have a really fun service planned for you. It's going to be epic, so bring your friends, bring your neighbors, your relatives, your co-workers, your neighbors, enemies, a Steelers fan or two. <laughs> Love you guys. See you next week. Hey, I'm Murph, and we really hope that you enjoyed this week's Adventure TV broadcast. We here at The Adventure have two main goals, to love God and to love people, and we hope that you felt that through this week's broadcast. If you would like to join us on Sunday mornings, we have services at 9 and 11, and also on adventurehome.org. Thank you again, and God bless. All creation worships you, all that never came.